Well, thank you for joining me today uh, for our Wednesday Bible class. We're going to be in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. My name is Ethan Milbury, and I preach for the Richfield Church of Christ, and I'm so grateful uh, that you're with me today. Whether you're a local member or a guest from somewhere else or from our community, thank you for joining us as we study the book of Ephesians. What we've been doing is we've been looking at this story in the book of Ephesians, a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the Christians in the region around the city of Ephesus, uh, and hearing what Paul has to say about the story of God, that God, through Christ, has achieved a salvation for us, that we have been forgiven of our sins in Christ, we've been raised to new life, we've been created in Christ Jesus to do good works for his glory. Uh, we are a new people, a new humanity, made up of both Jews and Gentiles who reflect the gospel of Christ, that the cross has brought us together, uh, and that we are, as the body of Christ, as the church, and Christ is our head, is that we are like a spiritual temple being built up for the glory of God, and that we are a people who prayerfully believe that God is able to do more than we ask or imagine for his glory in the life of the church. And so uh, all through this, we've been seeing this is a story about what God has done through Christ by the Spirit in the life of his people. And in chapters 4 through 6, the second half of the book, we're seeing uh, what does it mean to live a life worthy of the calling we've received? What does it mean to live a life worthy of the gospel as we follow Jesus within the life of the church and in our own individual lives? And so last week in chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, we talked about this idea uh, that Paul is urging and pleading the church uh, to live worthy of this calling and to recognize that we have been given the unity of the Spirit. We ought to uh, maintain or keep the unity of the Spirit, and the bond of peace. That God, through the Spirit, has already created unity for his people, for his body, but that we ought to participate in doing what we can in protecting the unity of God's people. And we realize that Paul says what we need in order to do that is to become a people who are gentle, who are patient, who are loving, uh, kind, gracious to one another, because all of us have our failings, all of us a sin, all of us... Uh, do things that annoy each other. None of us are perfect, and, and in order for us to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, it requires us to become people of love, gentleness, and patience. Not only that, but Paul says that the unity of the body of Christ is founded on some essential realities, some essential truths, these seven ones that Paul talks about, that there is one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And so the basis of our unity must be this core uh, set of beliefs and realities that we proclaim as the church of Jesus. And so now when we turn to chapter 4, verses 7 through 16, we're going to see Paul uh, continuing to talk about the life of the church and the reality of how do we grow into the likeness, the fullness of Christ. And that's really the question that he's going to answer. Is as he talks about this next section, he's going to answer the question, how does the church grow and become everything God desires it to be. And so what, what he's going to challenge us to realize is that it is not okay for us either as individuals uh, or as churches to remain spiritual infants, spiritual babes in Christ. In a sense, Paul is going to say, you must grow up. You must grow up into the fullness of Christ. And a way to summarize kind of what we're going to learn about in this chapter, and maybe you can hold on to this statement, is that Christ gave gifts to his body. So we may grow up to be like him. Christ gave gifts to his body so we may grow up to be like him. And we'll see that as we read the text together. So let's read in our Bibles chapter 4 verses 7 through 16 of Ephesians 4. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says when he ascended on high he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended in the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human coming, cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love, 
We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Okay, so let's walk through this text. First off, verse 7 tells us that Christ gives grace to each one. A grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And so what Paul is saying is that each one of us who is in Christ, we have received the grace of God, the gift of his grace. And this grace empowers us for the work of ministry, for building up the church, for serving Christ and his kingdom. And so we need to think about this reality that the grace of God uh, saves us from the power of sin and death. It transforms us. It changes us to be a new kind of people. And it empowers us or equips us for ministry. God's grace working in our lives draws us into his ministry, into his service. And so Christ is the one who has given gifts to each and every one of his people. He has given them generously. He has apportioned them according to his will is how he has distributed these gifts. And so what every one of us in Christ need to realize is we all have something to contribute to God and his kingdom in service to the body of Christ, to the church. And so what happens so often, though, is that churches are weakened when their members, when the different people who are part of the body of Christ, when they fail to use their gifts or when they choose not to contribute their ministry to the body of Christ, whether it's out in the world or within the local church, uh, God intends all of us to use our gifts for the ministry of his kingdom. And part of the truth of this message is that if Christ is the one who has apportioned our gifts, one, we should not feel envious of other people who have gifts different than ours, other Christians who are better or equipped or enabled by God's Spirit to do things that we're not able to do. And we should not feel pride about what we are able to do that may be different from others. Next, he talks about that Christ is a giver, like God is described in Psalm 68. So this is a, uh, maybe you've read this next section in verses 8 through 10 before and you thought, that's confusing. Let's read it again and talk about what it is that Paul's saying. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also has also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. Now what is Paul doing here? Paul is quoting from Psalm chapter 68, verse 18. And if you want to, you could take the time, you could pause the video right now if you'd like, and you could read all of Psalm 68 so that you get the context of Paul's quote. Uh, you don't have to do that, but you might want to, is that in Psalm 68, uh, the psalmist celebrates the strength of God, that God had ascended on high, he had received gifts, and he had gave gifts, that God had been uh, victorious over uh, the enemies of his people, and he had given gifts to his people. In fact, at the end of the psalm, in, in uh, Psalm 68, 35, we read that God gives power and strength to his people. Now, what is it that Paul is using this quote to argue? Well, he is using it to talk about what Christ has done, that Christ has ascended in his resurrection and his ascension to heaven to be enthroned at the right hand of God, that Christ has not only uh, descended, come to earth in the incarnation and become one of us to die on the cross, but he has also ascended to the right hand of God and he has offered in his victory over sin and death and over the spiritual forces of darkness, he has now offered gifts to his people for service in his kingdom. N.T. Wright says it this way, and I think this provides a good background for what Paul is trying to say, and I'm going to read this paragraph for us. A first century Jew might have understood this verse from the psalm to be speaking of Moses. After the Exodus... When the Egyptians were defeated and the Israelites rescued from slavery, Moses went up Mount Sinai and came down with the stone tablets of the law, the Torah. In line with several early Christian writings, Paul sees the ascension of Jesus as being in a sense like that of Moses. After the new exodus, which had been achieved in his death and resurrection, setting the human race free from bondage to sin and death, Jesus went up into the heavenly realm where he now reigns as Lord, Instead of coming down again with the law, as Moses had done, Jesus returned in the person of the Spirit, through whom different gifts are now showered on the church. So Christ had become one of us in his descent to earth, as how Paul would have understood that, I believe, is in, in his incarnation. And that Christ, in his resurrection, has ascended to the right hand of God. He has sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in his people. And the Holy Spirit is now the presence of God with us, giving us gifts 
for service in God's kingdom. And so what we're, what we're supposed to get by hearing this quote from Psalm 68 is that Paul is suggesting to us that Christ is also God. That's, I think, one of the implications of the way Paul is using this quote from Psalm 68 is Christ is God in the flesh, and Christ is the one who is giving gifts to his people. Okay, why does Christ give his gifts? What gifts does he give, and why does he give them to his people? Christ gives gifts to equip his people. Let's read verses 11 through 13 again. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds or pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So what are the gifts that Christ has given to his body? In this section, now you could read about other gifts that God gives to his people. Uh, in Romans 12, 1 through 8, you could read about it. In 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, you can read other texts where Paul talks about the spiritual gifts that are given to the body of Christ, to the church, for the building of the body. But in this text... Uh, Paul talks about that God, through Christ, has given the gifts of people serving in different roles in the life of the church. And so first he talks about apostles and prophets. These two have already been talked about together. Paul has identified himself in chapter 1, verse 1, as an apostle of Christ Jesus. Uh, and in chapter 2, verse 20 of Ephesians, I'll read that for us. We read these words, talking about the church, that it is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. And what does he mean when he used this word? Well, we've talked about that the apostles were people who were authorized and sent to preach the gospel, to plant new churches, to nurture them, and to oversee these churches as they grew in Christ and continued to proclaim the good news. And that there is a sense in which the New Testament talks about uh, big A apostles. I know this is... Uh, refreshing us on what we've talked about before in the sense that there are apostles talked about in the New Testament who are witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ who were authorized and sent out by Christ to proclaim the good news. And there are little a apostles in terms of people who functioned as messengers of the gospel with authority who were sent out to plant new churches uh, and to share the gospel and to help these churches grow in their service to God. And then alongside of the apostles, he talks about the idea of the prophets. Now, the prophets were also mentioned in chapter 2, verse 20. Uh, they're mentioned in chapter 3, verse 5. Let me read that there. Which was not made known to the sons of men and other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So what were the prophets supposed to do? The prophets were the people in the early church who communicated God's truth to God's people. Uh, they were to proclaim the word uh, to the church. And their role functioned in a very powerful way and in a very important way, especially when there was no uh, written scripture available to the people of God. The prophets were the ones who communicated and built up the church by proclaiming the word of God to the people. Then he talks about evangelists. And we can read about evangelists, th their description, uh, what they're told to do in different passages, for example, uh, let's read 2 Timothy 4, 5, where Paul, uh, talking to Timothy, says, uh, if you want to turn to 2 Timothy 4, 5 with me, I'll get there in a minute, in a minute, where Paul says to Timothy, uh, as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So what does it mean for a person to be an evangelist? Uh, what is re that referring to? An evangelist is someone who we believe shares the gospel with those who have not yet received it. Uh, they are primarily passionate and gifted by God to go and tell the gospel to people who have never heard of Jesus, who have never become Christians. Then he talks about the, this, this word pastors or shepherds. And who are these people? These are the people who are given the care for and overseeing of God's flock, that they are to protect and feed and oversee local churches. Um, we read about these people in several verses in the New Testament, uh, about the overseers, the elders, the shepherds, and God's expectations of what they were to do in caring for his flock. And then the last word that he uses is teachers. Teachers instruct God's people in the truths of God's word. Now, when we read all these different 
uh, roles together, there's a lot of overlap between them. There's a lot in common, and all of them come from the same source, that they are gifts of Christ to his church, that God has different people serving in these roles. And in fact, it's interesting to think about this, is that when you look at the person of Paul, he actually functions in all these different ways in the life of God's people. Uh, you can see him uh, functioning as an apostle, as a prophet, uh, as a shepherd, as a teacher uh, in some sense. He operates in both those ways, maybe not in the, in the ways that we think of 1 Timothy 3 or Titus 1 of the qualifications of an elder shepherd, but in many ways he fulfills much of the role uh, in the way he operates with his churches. He's an evangelist, he's a teacher, uh, and so we ought to think about these different roles and say that there's a lot of overlap, and in some people there may be uh, multiple of these, but I, I think the reality is, is most of us may be uh, those who find themselves being uh, in these kind of roles, see themselves a lot of times primarily as gifted in one area uh, to do the work that God has given them to do. And so God gave these different people to equip the saints, God's holy people, for the work of ministry. And so what, what we need to hear from this text is that all God's people participate in the ministry of Christ. Every follower of Christ is called to serve God and his people in the church and in the world. And so we're not meant to be consumers of ministry, meaning uh, somebody else does it for us and we receive all the benefits from somebody else doing it for us, but that we are to also be contributors of ministry. We're to be a part of working to build up the body of Christ and offering ourselves in service to God. And so when the people of God do their ministry, the body of Christ will be built up. And our desire, Christ's desire for his church is that it would grow in unity in maturity and in stature. So we've already said we have unity through the Spirit, and we are to strive to keep and protect that unity. But he says this unity is based on faith and knowledge of the Son of God, meaning that God's people grow in unity as they are built on the foundation of orthodoxy, uh, of true, true teaching, true belief about who Jesus is and about what the Word of God says about God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and what it means to live in a relationship with them. And so uh, if we're to grow in unity as the body of Christ, it must be built on the teachings of Scripture uh, and about Jesus, the Son of God. He says we're to grow into mature manhood, meaning we grow more into the image of the perfect man, Jesus Christ, in every way. It's not uh, some vague man. It is a specific man that we're to mature into being like, into being becoming like Jesus. Uh, and we're to grow in the stature of the fullness of Christ. What does that mean? It means that we grow to become more like Jesus, the perfect man. And then in verses 14 through 16, we're told that Christ is the one who grows his body. Christ is the one who grows his people. Let's read that text again. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And so Paul says we must no longer be spiritual infants or babies or children. How do you know someone is spiritually mature, immature? Paul says a spiritually immature person has a tendency to be influenced by uh, every felt, every fresh false wind of doctrine, uh, every deceitful teacher that comes along. And he uses the image of, of a new baby Christian who's not matured into the understanding of the gospel and of the teachings of scripture as they're almost like a boat that's being on the sea and every new wind that comes along pushes them over. Uh, every wave almost makes them sink uh, in that we ought to, instead of remaining in that state, we ought to grow up into maturity uh, so that we are not so easily swayed by those who would deceive us away from the truth of Scripture and the truth of Christ. And he says, rather, we ought to speak, be speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head. And so part of our growth in Christlikeness is not only that we have the right belief uh, as individuals and as the body of Christ, but we also become a people who speak the truth in love. And this truth that we speak must also be the truth that we live. Those two things go together, both what we say and what we do. And what is this truth that Paul is referring to? I believe it is the good news of God's work in Jesus Christ, that we must speak this truth to the world 
to those who are lost, to our brothers and sisters, we must remind them of it, but we must speak it in a way that is characterized by love. Now, that's true in other ways. Later, Paul's going to talk about how we speak truth in the community of the body of Christ, how we speak truth to one another. In Ephesians 4.25, he'll say, Therefore, having put away all falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. And so this has practical implications beyond just speaking the truth of the gospel in love. It's that every truth we speak with one another ought to be spoken uh, in a spirit of love. But often we are, uh, many of us are tempted to either speak truth without love or to speak love without any truth. And neither of those is truthful or loving. And so he says that Christ is a source of growth for his body. We grow from Jesus, our head, uh, that he is the source of our fullness and of our becoming more like him. And that every part of the body, he, he describes this body and he uses the image of ligaments and bones and uh, all these things knit together. Uh, and he says every part of the body is connected and dependent on each other. Every part of the body is important and needed for the whole. And so we ought to think about this text and say that each and every one of us, every one of you who is watching this video today, who has been called to be a disciple of Jesus, you are called to be a minister of Jesus Christ. That you are called to offer the gifts that Christ has given you in service to his church and in service to the world. Uh, that others might be built up and come to know Jesus. You know, I believe, I'm thankful that I get to serve uh, in full-time ministry. I'm glad that I get to use my gifts in this way, and I'm thankful that the church supports me financially to do this. But my role is not to do all the ministry for the church. Yes, my role is, is to preach and teach and pray and help others grow in Christ-likeness and do everything I can to build up this body and equip others. Uh, that's my what my primary role is, is not to do it all for all of us, but to help you do the work of ministry that God has called you to do, that God has gifted you to do, and to equip you for that. And I know this is an area I need to grow in, uh, but I would encourage you to think about how has God gifted me to serve his body and am I contributing my gifts? And is there any way that, that the people in my life, whether it's the elders or uh, it's the preacher, or Ethan, or it's somebody else, is there somebody who could help equip me uh, to grow in my use of this gift so that it is not wasted, but it's used for the good of the body of Christ? Well, I want to give you a few questions to reflect on together, and I hope that you will take time to pray about these, think about these on your own, or to talk about them with other brothers and sisters you may be watching this video with. Here's the first question. How do you view the gifts God has given you? Do you see them as an opportunity to serve God and his people? How does the way you use or not use your gifts show the truth of your answer? Number two, do you tend to speak truth without love or love without truth? Is there a situation into which you need to speak truth, but lovingly? And number three, how are you, or could you, start participating in the work of ministry in your church? How might you need equipping to do your part? Could you talk to your preacher or elders about how you might serve in your church? Uh, we want to see you equipped to do the work of ministry. We want to serve God together as the body of Christ so that we are built up and we grow into the fullness and the maturity of Jesus our Lord. Would you pray with me? Thanks for being with me. And these questions will be in the comments uh, in the descriptions of the videos, both on YouTube and Facebook. Let's pray. God, thank you that Jesus Christ has given us gifts to serve you in your kingdom. Thank you that he has given to the church, the apostles, the prophets, uh, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, all those who are sent to equip the body of Christ for the work of ministry. Lord, equip us all to do the work that you've given us to do. Lord, grow us as a body of Christ into the fullness and stature and unity of Christ. Lord, we pray especially for our church family here at Richfield uh, that you would mature us in our faith and in our unity and in our Christ-likeness and that you would uh, use every member of this body use their gifts for the work of ministry. God, we pray this in the name of Jesus, and we say together, amen. Thanks for being with me. I love you. I hope that you've been blessed, and if there's any way I can begin to equip you, help you to do the ministry God's called you to, let me know how I can do that. Thank you. Bye.